Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kristen Mulherin, and this is the next webinar in GoProto and Re3D Tech's Office Hour series. Uh, today we'll be talking about Polymer 3D printing technologies, which ones and why you would use them. Um, it's a one hour and it's a broad subject. Um, we will go into more details in subsequent webinars based on your questions throughout and just your general feedback. Um, let's see. Um, this is a bit of introduction. GoPoto and V3D Tech have combined under core industrial partners to form one of the largest and most complete custom rapid manufacturing companies in the US. But I'm going to let Jesse and Peter here introduce themselves and explain a bit more. Jesse? Thanks, Kristen. I appreciate it a lot. Um, my name is Jesse Lee. I'm a 25 year student of the rapid manufacturing space, working with clients across the country and around the world. I've been a part of incredibly diverse product development programs from early prototyping for products like the iMac in the 90s through high volume additive manufacturing for projects like HP's 580 color 3D printers. Uh, listening to client partner needs, utilizing the latest and greatest array of manufacturing technologies and working with the best people in the product development and manufacturing community to deliver best in class manufacturing experiences is what I find most exciting. And I am Peter Kutstra. I am the chief operating officer here at V3D Tech. Um, prior to my time here, spent some uh, time in the field working directly with uh, customers and actually working um, selling printers uh, direct with the OEMs. Uh, spent some time with the metal printing industry as well as uh, plastics uh, printing industry um, which is where I fell in love with actually working hands-on with our customers um, and actually working on their applications, um, which is what I do today. Um, and I love my, uh, my opportunity to uh, work and expand on those applications and pretty excited to talk about some of those applications today. Great, thanks guys. Awesome. So uh, here's an agenda for what we're gonna talk through today. Uh, as you notice, when you registered for this event, you had to put in a question of what, or a comment on what you were hoping to get most out of this webinar. So I've taken those questions and we've used those questions to form the content of this presentation. Um, I might have paraphrased them in one form or another, but you will see that they're all in here in one form or another. I still encourage you strongly to ask questions throughout. We want this to be an interactive exchange. We want this um, to be a bit more dynamic. We don't want to be talking at you. We want to be talking with you. Um, and so we will try to address all the questions that you submit uh, as we go through. You'll notice um, a few of you asked about metal 3D printing. This specific uh, webinar is about polymers, um, polymer 3D printing technologies. We will be doing a subsequent webinar on the metal 3D printing technologies, but right now we, we have to focus on one or else we'll be here for, for hours. <laughs> um, we also, I noticed a lot of your questions uh, were around materials. We are addressing materials. We will talk about materials in a general sense, but we do have plans also to do a more deep dive on those materials in a subsequent uh, office hour session as well. So um, with that said, uh, pass it over to Jesse. He's gonna give you a bit of background. Great. Thanks again for the introduction, Kristen. And I take a moment to thank you all for attending. We appreciate the time very much. And today we hope to provide valuable rich content um, and encourage you to continue to attend our ongoing monthly webinar series where we will continue to focus on important aspects of rapid custom manufacturing. So just a bit, just a brief, uh, you know, GoProto and Re3D Tech is a rapid manufacturing platform that was coalesced together by core industrial partners uh, to bring industry leading service to our customers in the rapid product development and production space using a very wide range of capabilities to produce a prototype through production plastic, metal, and elastomer parts. So as this graphic shows, we have a huge toolbox of manufacturing technologies. And we are, we call ourselves technology agnostic, where we will utilize the best conventional as well as 3D printing or additive technologies to help span the entire product development and manufacturing cycle from showing up there in the upper left, ideation, engineering, DFAM or design for additive manufacturing, um, then into, into using those, that engineering, those CAD files for concept models, engineering and validation 3D prints, urethane castings, CNC machining, and then into rapid injection tooling and molding, as well as sheet metal, and additive manufacturing or using 3D printing for high volume to manufacture production parts. 
uh, rounded out with complete finishing and secondary processes to put the finishing touches on your manufactured parts to make them look great and also meet your specs for uh, things like tapping and inserts, plating, or even assembly uh, for use in your products. Or also keep in mind, we're also speaking about jigs and fixtures and assembly aids as well. So our entire business model centers around speed and great customer service. We love making uh, great parts and we'll use whatever tools are needed to help our customers hit those, hit those goals. So many, many of the questions from your registration uh, today circled around cost and speed and best application. Um, and part of what we'd like to emphasize is that there isn't always one clear cut answer. Uh, we very often work with our clients to understand their needs and then custom tailor the solution, including working with them on engineering their products to be optimized for a manufacturing process or combination of processes so we can get them to that best pricing and speed and functional results through efficiency gained by awesome designs. So we have a hands-on approach uh, and we care a lot about the outcomes. So this webinar today goes over some of the possible additive manufacturing tools to give you more information so you can make informed design decisions so your products best fit the processes so you can get the optimal pricing, lead time, and quality outcomes. So then on this slide, what, what 3D printing technologies are we talking about? There is a lot to cover today in a short hour time slot. So we're gonna focus on three, the three primary technologies that cast kind of the widest capabilities net for printing parts in polymers or plastics. So today's focus will be on powder bed technology uh, using HP's multi-jet fusion. We'll use extrusion technologies um, from FDM and Stratasys, or excuse me, uh, Stratasys and Mark Forged. Um, and then laser cured photopolymer technology using stereolithography by 3D systems. So we'll focus on additive metal, as Kristen said, uh, technologies in future webinars. So the next slide. So then this graphic is an attempt to show just kind of some, some um, criteria of, of good fits or best for, and then also maybe not the best for. Those were a lot of questions from the registrations today. So there, there are many different criteria by which to evaluate the usefulness of any of these technologies for your specific intended use. We've attempted here to have a few of the, the high level criteria um, by which to evaluate and the, the three technologies, by which to evaluate the three technologies we're talking about today. Um, so MJF or multi-jet fusion is ideal for durable, high strength, highly flexible and isotropic or similar mechanical properties in all directions is what isotropic means, parts. Um, so it's, it's very fast for high quantities of typically small to medium sized parts. It produces parts with, as we show, you know, good cosmetics. And it has a light texture when they're completed equivalent to like a mold tech 11,010 or 11,020. FDM is excellent for larger, maybe more flat parts, which is a question we got a lot. It's, it's excellent range of materials allows for flame rating, also for, for flight applications, in-flight applications. It's well suited to some lower tolerance applications where rougher surface uh, quality is acceptable, such as, as I mentioned earlier, jigs and fixtures or assembly aids. And then SLA on the right is ideal for higher resolution on clear white or even black parts, where you may um, be looking for, for prototype, early prototyping to check fit and function from very small parts, very small precision parts to, to very, very large parts. It can produce parts with excellent surface finish, so it's ideal for secondary painting for cosmetic models. So then down below on the, on the not the best side of the equation for these technologies, we know that MJF isn't ideal for, for real large parts or critically flat parts as it's more limited in the build size than FDM or SLA. And the, the thermodynamics of the heating and cooling of the build can, can result in stresses in the built parts that can make it difficult to get flat parts flat. Um, it's also not ideal for super high precision or real high cosmetics such as clay, class A surface parts because it'll require a lot of secondary work and, and that might drive up that pricing. So FDM can produce high precision parts but is, is quite an anisotropic properties or, or um, process, both in its mechanical performance and its ability to maintain precision in the Z 
uh, direction where layers stack up to reduce dimensional capability and part strength. So due to the low resolution in the Z and the very visible build lines in this process, it's not ideal for high cosmetics. Stereolithography, on the other hand, as I mentioned, is good for cosmetics. Now it's not, not great for real high mechanical strength or high heat or chemically resistant parts. It also has supports that are attached to the parts when they're finished or when they're built. So just like FDM does really. So that may create a lot of finishing work, which can slow the process and, and make parts more costly and can reduce the dimensional accuracy due to, due to finishing as well. Okay, so then. So Jesse, actually we've got a couple slide. questions here before we okay, uh, move on. Um, yeah. One real quick one. Uh, why, are, why are we talking about Stratasys FDM, but not Stratasys Polyjet? Um, we just chose today to speak on the on these three technologies. Um, Stratasys Polyjet is an, is an excellent technology. It's similar to stereolithography. Uh, it produces high precision parts. It can produce parts in uh, some some very high strength uh, photopolymers as well. But we just chose to stay to speak on the uh, on the laser based system from three to six. And, and a really good away. good question here as well is how do you define small or medium sized parts? That's a great question. It tends to be uh, parts with, I, I would phrase it mostly with, with parts with very thin walls. Any of the 3D printing technologies start to struggle at around 20 thousandths or half a millimeter, somewhere around there. Um, so if you have a very small part with super thin walls, then uh, that, that may tend to push us one direction or another. Something else to consider is things like supports, where if you build a real thin wall stereolithography and then have to figure out how to break off the support, may not work well. And so we may actually coach you more toward multi-jet fusion. So small can depend on the actual physical part size and then also wall thickness or feature uh, size. Okay. Um, we've got actually a couple more great questions here. And I think this is a, a, a very big meat of the webinar. So we're going to run with them. Um, from Eric Schner, which process would be best for stronger parts? Great question. Um, we find that typically multi-jet fusion is, is amazing in its ability to, to create strong parts. Also, I mentioned earlier isotropic. So in the Z, it doesn't have as much material strength degradation as FDM or SLA to some degree. Um, FDM also makes very, very strong parts in both the, the Stratasys as well as the Mark Forged. And we'll talk about that later. Pete, we'll, we'll go into that. We can make some extremely strong parts in those processes that are, that are similar even to machined metal parts. So the, the answer is that it kind of depends on the material you want to use and the geometry you have on which one's going to end up being the, the strongest. And we can consult to help answer that question. Um, OK, um, just real quick for the audience, we do have a lot of questions here. If I don't get to them, it means because I know we're going to get to it a bit later. So don't think I'm ignoring you. Um, <laughs> but another question, just to follow up on that one. What is your sure. threshold for strong? That depends entirely on the application, really. Um, like, I find that you know the stereolithography, for example, has materials now that are much stronger than they were when it was introduced in the early '90s. Uh, so it's gotten much you know stronger. I can consider, I, and Pete, you know, you you may join in here too. Generally strong equal means similar to in the 3D printing space, similar strength to conventionally manufactured parts being machined or injection molded. So that's kind of what we're we're trying to make 3D printed parts that are able to be you know used for production, which means they're going to be as strong as what a conventionally manufactured part would be. Yeah, just to add a note to that, you know, if you're looking at uh, replacing or having a similar plastic uh, level strength, you know, the MJF technology does provide probably the most comparable uh, to an injection molded uh, plastic. And uh, as Jesse had mentioned, you're going to end up with the isotropic performance, which is is really key, um, simply because you don't see that in many other uh, additive technologies. Now, if you're looking to replace metal components with uh, plastics or composites, that's really where the Mark Forge technology shines. Uh, it does, you know, require a little bit upfront kind of investment into understanding the application and what you're trying to get out of that part. But uh, it is a great fit for replacing uh, metal components and getting metal-like strength out of your your composite part. Really good questions. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, let's do. We got one more. I, um, how uh... How does part durability compare across the technologies? Um, there's a lot of, uh, and that durability is kind of a loose term. I'm not totally sure what that means um, exactly. So I'll kind of think about the durability might mean, say, abrasion resistance uh, or repeated cycles of stress. And um, that can depend very much on build orientation, part shape, um, or, or part design, as well as the build um, 
technologies. Multi-jet fusion has got, as we just have mentioned, it's isotropic. It also is generally very good at repeated cycles. Uh, FDM can be very strong, but it, since, it's, since it um, stacks parts up in the Z and there's not complete bonding between the build layers, you might find that durability in, in the Z direction, if you're pulling like a sheet of plywood, if you, if you pull on it or push on it in the direction where the build layers are, it might start to delaminate. It doesn't really mean that the material fails exactly, it just means that the parts kind of come unstuck from one another. And there's some secondary finishing we can do to improve that, and the technologies have gotten better with that over the years. Um, but it, it does it, uh, exhibit some sort of problems there. So kind of in the way that they're ordered here, you'd probably find the multi-jet fusion because of those isotropics is the most um, durable. FDM is kind of next, I would say, and stereolithography is going to be on the lower end. Yeah, and generally speaking, um, additive parts do well with compressive uh, resistance simply because the layer lines are, uh, you know, impacted um, in, in the overall part quality. Uh, when it comes to actual kind of tensile loading, um, it can be a little bit dependent. And uh, like Jesse had mentioned, MJF and, and FDM can have some variation there, but MJF would probably be recommended for anything under tensile loading. Okay. So moving on, a lot of questions are submitted in these two categories. What are the use cases for each technology and what are the materials available for each technology? Uh, so we're gonna go through these on a, on a technology by technology basis. So starting things off with uh, SLA. Great, uh, so I'll speak on this just a bit. Um, stereolithography is the kind of the graphic shows is a laser based system where the laser strikes the surface of a photopolymer, liquid photopolymer and through phase change converts it from, from liquid into solid. And then the, the build platform sinks down into the, uh, into the build vat and the process is repeated layer by layer to build the part. So primarily speaking about materials, we, we primarily work with two, um, the, the Acura line of resins and the Somos line of resins. Um, Acura is from 3D Systems, uh, Somos is from DSM Somos. So the reasons for this and how it fits in our toolbox is, is um, they both make excellent materials in white and clear. Uh, there's also black available, as I mentioned. Um, there are other specialty resins, but uh, these materials that we have here, they represent the largest uh, swath of, of capability, the best general purposes. Um, so both for, for the strength that we talked about, as well as flexibility and cosmetics, and then some clarity. So if, if you want white, I would recommend the Acura 25, the Extreme White uh, 200, or Somos Next. And then if you want uh, clear parts, then Acura 60 or Somos 11 and 122 work excellently. Um, so a quick note on, on clear is that to make parts transparent, like is shown in the pictures, um, they'll need to have secondary finishing done then too, that includes sanding or sandblasting to remove the supports and the remnants from the supports, and then to provide the, the clarity. Um, that can add, the, you know, that means they're painted, so that can add a little bit of tolerance to them and also possibly round uh, sharp corners, so just something to be aware of. So then some examples of, of applications for SLA that are their great uses are things like uh, housings, electronic housings, uh, windows, and light pipes for clear parts, so you can see through to see interferences, um, check, you know, graphics below them and so on, bezels, front bezels for electronics or healthcare equipment, um, case clamshells, and then even master patterns, which we use for cast urethane, paint, which we'll discuss a little bit uh, later. So then next slide. Real quick question. How oh, do you prevent sure. warping of round slash cylindrical features using SLA? That has a lot to do with build orientation. Um, it, these are all kind of our these, these are all layer by layer process, which means they make round shapes by just like stairs, the, the rise over the run. Um, so if you're building a, a round feature in the Z, the laser will trace the outside and make the part very, of the, the round shape and make the part very round. Whereas if it's built on its side, you might get more of a stop sign type shape. Um, so, so that's one is, is orientation, intelligence supports when doing the building and then in finishing and uh, treatment of the part as well as just shipping, like making sure the parts are shipped well so they end up uh, not warped is very, very important in the stereolithography process. So that's especially true when during the summer or warm months when it, it starts to get warm, it can affect the parts. Yeah, so taking a look at maybe the most well-known uh, 3D printing method and, and one of the oldest uh, printing methods out there, 
uh, is known as FDM, um, which stands for Fused Deposition Modeling. You might have also heard it referred to as FFF, which stands for Fused Filament Fabrication. Um, but really to break it down and, and kind of oversimplify it, uh, you're looking at a print head that acts very similar to almost like a hot glue gun where you're actually feeding a, a plastic material into it, heating it up and extruding it out through a nozzle. Um, now, what's nice about this is it, it kind of uh, spans really a majority of all the thermoplastics that are available for injection molding as well. So you do have a, a wide array of materials that you can work with. And um, it is very simplistic in the way that, it, that it, it tends to work because you are just having a simple layer process where you're essentially uh, tracing that outs, outside exterior pattern. Um, and it does allow you to kind of control your infill patterns as well. When we take a look at what materials are readily available and what makes sense to print with, uh, we typically stick with uh, some of the nylons. Uh, so we can print with a, a PA-12 or a nylon-12. Uh, can also print with a, uh, a composite version of that with uh, about 20% chopped carbon fiber in it. Um, we can then also look at some of our more traditional uh, thermoplastics like ABS, uh, polycarbonate, and ASA. Um, and then all the way up to some of our really high-end engineer grade uh, thermoplastics like our Altums 1010 and Altum 9085. Those tend to be really good for aerospace applications as well as some medical applications because it does have biocompatibility. Um, this also has a wide range of applications that we can uh, use this technology for, uh, but the best fit usually is gonna be for jigs and fixtures, things that uh, you're gonna have low quantities or low volumes of parts that you need, but uh, maybe some very, you know, very complex designs or something that is uh, best fit to be replaced every few months. So uh, it can be used for prototyping, but things like SLA would probably be a better fit for that, um, where FDM is really going to be kind of uh, utilizing some of the unique materials that are available there and um, you know, fitting it into maybe things like tooling, jigs, and fixtures. So looking at a little bit of a tangent to the FDM technology uh, would be the Mark Forged FDM printing process. Uh, you might've also heard this referred to as CFF or CFR, uh, which stands for Continuous Filament Reinforcement. Now, what's unique about this is that uh, you're actually printing with two different materials um, rather than just one with the FDM. And uh, the way this kind of actually uh, you know, comes into the, to the process is that secondary print nozzle um, is actually laying down um, continuous fiber within your part. So looking at the graphic on the, the, the screen here, um, this is actually a brake lever that's been cut in half so you can actually see the interior of the part. So uh, you'll notice that on the perimeter of the part, there's actually a different color material there. That is your continuous fiber that is uh, reinforcing the exterior of the part. Now, uh, What's unique about that is you have full control over how you can infill the, the part with the fiber and really dictate and kind of control the overall strength of it. So uh, we're working with about four different uh, reinforcement fibers that are available. Um, carbon fiber, which many people are, are very familiar with, great for stiff uh, parts and, and kind of controlling your flexibility of the part. Uh, we have fiberglass, which is very cost effective in, in being able to produce a strong part. We have HSHT fiberglass, which stands for high strength, high temp fiberglass, really great for some uh, very high end application needs, um, really expands your uh, overall heat and, and thermal capacity of your part. And then Kevlar, which is uh, really great for impact resistance and even building in things like living hinges to your part. Now, uh, to kind of explain the, the composite uh, scenario that's happening here, you actually have a composite within a composite. So uh, the black material that you're looking at there um, outside of just the fiber, that is a nylon six blended with about 20% chopped carbon fiber into it. So uh, that material is referred to as onyx and uh, it's, it's Mark Forge's uh, flagship material and um, great baseline material to print with, but when you do incorporate the fiber in there, you can really do some unique applications. Um, as well as that material, the Onyx material comes uh, available in an ESD rated version, as well as a flame retarded version. So uh, you can look at doing things, you know, jig and fixtures for the electronics industry, all the way up to printing and use components for aerospace applications. Um, and then a new material that is available uh, within that uh, technology is the Altum 9085 um, and something that is uh, very interesting to see where, where the, the technology kind of uh, lends us to, to being able to do different applications. Um, right now, primarily looking at the aerospace industry though. 
So quick question, um, both pertaining to the FDM materials as well as the MJF nylons, and then I think we'll also the SLA when we come up, is what are the temperature ratings on these materials? Yeah, so that is, uh, you know, a little bit flexible based on some of the fiber that you can embed into the Mark Force technology, at least. So upwards of 145 degrees um, Fahrenheit for some of the uh, baseline onyx materials. Um, so that's roughly about 300 degrees Celsius. Um, so right now, uh, that, that's just with the baseline onyx. If you embed the HSHT fiberglass into the parts, um, you can actually uh, get upwards of 160 degrees um, and, and uh, be dependent on the, the, the length of exposure there. So um, with the Altums though, you can get to really, really high end uh, uh, temperatures. Now, I don't have direct experience in using some of the Altum 9085 just yet uh, to be able to speak to specific numbers, but you know, you're looking um, pretty much at what would you be able to do with uh, some of the injection molded Altums. Um, on, on that ranging capacity. Right. And, and again, just as to follow up on something I said earlier, we do have a lot of questions on materials. We'll try to get to them at the end, but we're also going to keep an eye on all of these materials questions to put into the next webinar that's going to be on materials. Exactly. Okay, so then um, speaking about the next technology is multi-jet fusion. Just a little bit of background of what this technology is. That is the, the printers that are behind me in my, uh, my background there are the HP multi-jet uh, 4200 machines. Uh, so multi-jet fusion from HP is a powder bed technology where a thin layer of fine powdered nylon or polypropylene or the elastomers that I mentioned uh, before TPA and TPU is rolled onto the surface of a build tray in the build unit. <clears throat> uh, the printer then applies a layer of inkjet droplets called fusing and detailing agents to the surface in the cross section of the profile of the part. And then a high intensity light source passes over the print bed and wherever those droplets were applied, they absorb enough heat to fuse the powdered material together into a solid. The print bed then drops and another layer is formed by repeating the process and that is repeated over and over until the build is completed. The builds range uh, roughly from two hours to 16 hours, depending on how tall the build is. But the build density, how many parts you build on that layer does not affect the build time, which is a big advantage of multi-jet fusion that I wanna make sure we covered a little bit. So I think so this then, is a good time to ask Jesse, um, out yep. of, oh, sorry, did, if you wanna finish that, nope, sorry. That's, that's okay. great. Um, out of all of these processes, is there one that excels at minimizing the necessity of support material? Yes, that's a good question, being that we're in, in multi-jet fusion. Um, multi-jet fusion is built, I mentioned before that wherever the droplets were applied, the um, and then the, the energy source passes over and fuses it, um, the, the areas that don't have droplets are left as powdered material. So when the build is done, it's, um, it's a large cubic volume of powdered material with parts embedded in it. So we vacuum out the un, uncentered powder Take the, the, the parts then are kind of uh, are covered with some material that we have to um, vacuum off and then and then bead blast or tumble. But there's no supports, the physical supports that connect the part to the build plate like there are with that the FDM technologies or the stereolithography or back to the object question, uh, the, the object uh, or DLP technologies have supports as well. So that means that you don't have a sacrificial side in multi-jet fusion. Also, if you have trapped features that are say in a manifold where you might have a, a, um, a hole that goes, a tube that goes through the part and, and take some bends where you can't get finishing tools in there, we can use compressed air um, and even just shake and vibe to get the powder out so we can end up making some geometries that aren't possible with some of the other technologies. Jesse, just real quick, um, someone earlier asked if we were gonna show parts. Uh, I think we've shown a lot of pictures, but I think you do have one part you can show. Yeah, so let's talk about these materials here a little bit. Um, the, the, the main material that we produce parts in in MJF is, is nylon um, or PA-12, which is a, a um, standard standard nylon. Here's here's a part I can show that's a, a small ball and it has a ball within a ball. It's very strong, um, great general purpose material. There's also a PA12 glass bead, which is a um, same base material but has glass beads in it. This this sample part is the glass bead material. It's very strong in compression. 
It does make it because they're glass beads. It can make the parts somewhat brittle because they're they're small round glass beads, not fibers like with injection molding that end up kind of locking together during molding. So something to consider with a glass bead. Then there's PA11, which is a high strength uh, and, and great flexibility material from Arkema um, based in castor bean oil. It's a you know a little bit more of an environmental material than the other two. It's also highly flexible. It's a it's an excellent material. Then there's the polypropylene. Um, that's a that's a great general purpose polypropylene. The intent is to have the parts be a little less expensive, also uh, quite flexible. So polypropylene, we uh, we run at our facility in outside of Chicago. And then elastomers are important to note. Uh, there's TPA, which is thermoplastic amide, which is 88A uh, durometer. And then there's TPU or thermoplastic urethane. There's two manufacturers of that material, and they're both 95A. Um, the TPA I have a sample of here. This is a little lattice cubed. Um, cube lattice. The exciting thing is just how strong it is, how able it is to make uh, repeated flexes over and over. So that durability question before, it's also very high wear resistance. So if it's used towards things like shoe soles and um, grips that are going to be used over and over, it will perform very much like a production elastomer because it is production elastomer just printed in the powder form. Um, so that's a little run through on multi-jet fusion. Does that answer that question, Kristen? Yeah, I think there's a couple more I think we can just squeeze in really quickly if we can answer them quick. You um, bet. This is, I think, a, a complicated, but maybe not for you. I'm not sure. Do you have a height versus print time ratio? Um, it is a little complicated because that depends. With multi-jet fusion in specific, it, de it depends on the build density. And the build density will affect how slowly the, the, um, the build cools down. Um, so short answer is there isn't an exact ratio. It will depend a little bit on the on the build. Um, so I'll I'll stop there. And then what's the what's the minimum drain hole diameter uh, you need for removing powder from from a MGF hollow part? Um, that's going to be right around a millimeter. Um, it's going to depend on the the shape of the hole and the um, how able we're able to get in and and clear out the material. If it's in an area that has got really, it builds up a lot of heat, then the powder may tend to stick a little bit more. So we need to get in there and clean it out. So answer is it, it varies. Um, something else, Kristen, I'll, I'll jump in there that um, MJF was, there's a question about is MJF production capable and for what materials? And we talked through the materials here a little bit, but one of its exciting roles is, is that it is used for prototyping. So 3D printing um, with multi jet fusion. It also is extremely capable for additive manufacturing in that nylon, in the nylons, polypropylenes, and the elastomers uh, that we talked about. It's you know production cap capability uh, in MJF is it's really changed the 3D printing industry since it was introduced in 2017 because it's it's very fast for producing high quantities. It's inexpensive per part for higher quantities. It also produces parts in those production materials. So they answer the questions to what's the heat deflection? What are the, how durable is it? You know, it's, it's going to perform very, very similarly to production plastics. So it's, uh, it's something that can be used in, in, uh, instead of some of those conventional processes. It also has repeatable performance and then those great isotropic properties. It also has, has good cosmetics, as you can see in the sample parts and the parts that I held, the sample part pictures, as well as the parts that I held up. All right, moving on to uh, product life cycle. Excellent. So this kind of speaks to some of that same um, same my concepts that I was just speaking of. That uh, the, the the graphic shows the product life cycle with um, with the product life cycle stage on the horizontal and quantities on the vertical axis. Uh, the manufacturing technologies are shown in yellow or blue, and where they overlap, it's it's green. So our capabilities at GoPro Re3D Tech, Re3D Tech uh, span the entire range, but certain technologies are ideal for various portions, which we'll cover in these next uh, few slides. So then next slide. This shows sterilothography, for example, which is typically only used and has been historically um, used for the early ideation and prototype stages. Um, this is primarily due to those material limitations, but also due to its relatively slow production rate for higher quantities. It's ideal, however, for quick manufacture of uh, form and function models during the ideation and prototyping stages of product development. SLA was one of the first 3D printing technologies made available um, in the early to mid 90s. It still has very useful function for quick and inexpensive cosmetic, or also I mentioned before the, the large or high precision parts. And next slide. Yeah, so FDM, uh, like I had referenced earlier, is maybe 
you know, one of the most uh, widely used um, technologies currently. And uh, it does have a great fit kind of in a variety of different spaces um, within the product life cycle. So uh, one of the, you know, most common uses is ideation and prototyping. Um, although there are probably some better technologies out there, uh, just the wide use of FDM technology does have it also widely used for ideation and prototyping. Um, but it is also a really good fit for that kind of initial portion of bridge production. So when your quantities are low enough that uh, it doesn't make sense maybe to jump right into injection molding, but still in a scenario where you need a couple hundred units of something to fully test it out, uh, it can be a great fit for that uh, initial bridge production uh, scenario. And then looking at the tail end of the product life cycle, um, scenarios where you no longer want to hold on to the tooling for an injection molded piece or something that is actually just no longer manufactured by a, a, a supplier. Um, it can be a great fit for low quantities where maybe you need to, to provide a, a part that broke in on your production line off of a, you know something that is no longer produced or manufactured. You can kind of actually uh, fit it in there to be a uh, a great fit for that one-off piece that you can't get anywhere else. Great, and then this um, this slide shows kind of the power, and that I mentioned earlier, the kind of game game changing that occurred with multi jet fusion, and and why it's had such a significant impact on ra rapid manufacturing, because it it really spans the entire product life cycle from that early ideation through bridge as well as then into full scale production and then on the tail end uh, into obsolescence and spare parts manufacturing. Um, it is limited primarily by cost for higher quantity as you get into the quantities we show here that it, it tends to tail off after say 50,000 depending on the, the size of the parts and how efficiently they fit in builds. It's also limited by the currently available materials being the, the nylon based material, the polypropylene and the TPU and TPAs. That's expanding, um, so it will continue to, to have more applications. And then also um, cosmetics and tolerances can can uh, limit its application for productions. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, working through engineering and um, design with our clients can help us make that process be be more applicable for more parts. Also, as CAD software capabilities become more, as well as you know your um, imagination as engineers. Um, also, things like latticing, light weighting, you know, more applications, more. Um, just imagination from the user base, uh, we'll see multi-jet fusion as well as the rest of the 3D printing technologies continue to grow in their viable applications. So the next slide. Yeah, so uh, taking a, a quick look at, you know, some of the um, additional finishing techniques that we can apply to the technologies we talked about today. Before I dive into maybe explaining some of these uh, specific finishing techniques, I'll mention that um, this is arguably, you know, the most important uh, part of, of the whole printing process and really where you can have a bit of a differentiator in, in the overall success of, of the part that you're printing. Um, and also mention that it's better to have this conversation ahead of time before you even get into printing your part, because a lot of times we can accomplish the end goal of the application uh, directly with a finishing technique, uh, but that does need to be kind of discussed and, and talk about some of the things that come with these different finishing techniques. And sometimes you don't have to accomplish uh, you know, your overall range of, you know, your HDT or something like that with the material itself, you can maybe accomplish it with a different finishing technique. It's a little bit easier to, um, you know, accomplish that way. So taking a look at some of the specific uh, different finishing techniques, uh, we'll first look at dyeing. Dyeing is widely used and, and readily known by quite a few customers already. Um, and that typically gives you a wide range of colors that you can work with. Uh, it's a batch process and, and relatively easy to do, you know, in production as well. And it does uh, lend itself to not impacting the overall uh, quality of the part, uh, as well as the dimensional accuracy of it. Vapor smoothing, which is a little bit of a newer process and different finishing technique than some people are used to, but it is uh, widely used and, and continuing to grow as maybe the most widely used finishing technique specifically for the MJF. It is a chemical process as well as a batch process. So we can do large quantities and, and volumes for it, but probably the best way to think about it is it's gonna be the way to get the closest finish to an injection molded piece uh, that you can get off of the variety of different uh, printing techniques out there. 
it does add a little bit of uh, mechanical performance to your parts as well. So you can kind of think of it as essentially surface hardening your, your part where you will get some uh, impact on the overall performance of your part as well. Painting, uh, pretty straightforward if you've ever painted anything. It does add a little bit of thickness to your part, so be aware of that ahead of time and kind of where that uh, initial conversation comes into play. But it does give you highly repeatable uh, coloring process to your parts, and it does uh, overall you know, lend itself to end, end use production parts. Cerakote, which is a really unique finishing process and something that I personally really like using. Uh, it is essentially applying a ceramic coat to your, your part. So it is a spray technique and it does uh, roughly put on about four thou additional uh, thickness to your part. So again, something that you're gonna wanna talk about ahead of time uh, if it is something that you're interested in doing, but it can get, achieve a very hard surface finish to your part and uh, kind of open up the different applications that are available uh, for your technology. Hydrographics, which is a really cool way of applying a variety of different graphics to your part. It is a dipping process and you know does have some minor variation from part to part, but it gives you essentially an unlimited uh, you know options to be able to apply a, a graphic to your part. And it does not add any additional thickness and um, relatively easy to do, whether it's a one-off or you know a few parts uh, within hand. Metalization, which is a little bit of a newer finishing process that um, not everyone might have you know, some familiarity with, but it's essentially applying a metal coat to your part. Uh, and maybe the easiest way to think about it is like chrome plating a, a part, whether it's plastic or metals. So it does get a very shiny surface finish and it does uh, also incorporate uh, adding a little bit of additional thickness to your part. Uh, so again, something you're gonna wanna talk about ahead of time before you, you get into that process. Uh, it is worth mentioning though that the metallization does probably add the longest lead time to your part. So you know, be aware if that is something that you're interested in, that, that you're gonna kind of have to build that into the overall application of the part. Okay, we got two questions here. Um, what temperature is needed to cure the CR coat? That's a good question. It, it, there's two different lines of, of um, Cerakote finish, but both of them are high enough, kind of depends on the, on the colors, but they're high enough that we haven't traditionally applied it to say sterile lithography or some of the other materials because it will melt apart. So um, it's up high enough that it's, it's nearing the glass transition temperature of, um, of the multi-jet fusion materials. Um, so it's, it's fairly high, which can have some effect on the, on the, uh, the, there was a question asked earlier about curved surfaces and so on. Um, and as Pete mentioned, having some consultation at the beginning, if we plan on Cerakoting, we want to look at the geometry and make sure that it will be, it won't relax when heated, um, during the post bake after the application of the spray. All right. Speaking of geometry, um, will any of the finishing techniques beyond vapor work on parts with multiple undercuts? Will they? Can you repeat that question? I'm sorry, Kristen. Yeah. Sorry. Will any of the finishing techniques beyond vapor work on parts with multiple undercuts? Ah, oh. I would say yes, but it will require some rotation. So Cerakote is is a spray process, and you know, so that may require, say, just kind of manually as it's being sprayed, um, turn it around. Hydrographics is definitely something that has a consideration for for build orientation and undercuts. It is it's applied on a surface of of water and the part is dipped through it. And so as the graphic wraps around, it's gonna reach a limitation of its thickness and it will soon you know, go away. So if you're trying to say do a sphere, you would need to turn it over. And as Pete mentioned earlier, <clears throat> you might have some registration issues. So hydrographics is pretty, pretty limited on its ability to handle undercuts. Metallization can be done depending on how it's applied, which type of metallization, um, the polarity, the, the electric, uh, electrical nature of it can draw the metal um, up into some undercuts, but it's also going to be fairly, fairly limited. Same with painting. Great. We'll move on to specific technologies then. Okay, great. Um, so SLA, uh, the common finishing for SLA is typically painting and much more rare, but still possible is metallization. Um, painting, as Pete said, is pretty, pretty straightforward, except to that with stereolithography, I mentioned earlier, it's got to support build supports that are attached to the parts. So they'll need to be sandblasted or hand sanded or a combination of the two away so that you get smooth um, surface finish. And then um, add, add primer if it's needed and then surface finish, surface um, color paint layer, and then possibly a clear coat. So that could add some, you know, somewhere between two to 10 thousandths of an inch, depending on how many layers you need to add. 
um, but it is, uh, we've been doing that for a long time. We're very good at it. Sterilophography is definitely the best process out of these three that we're talking about today to get good, very high cosmetics out of uh, uh, painted 3D printed parts. Metallization can also improve those cosmetics that Pete talked about. It also really can improve um, strength of stereolithography or heat deflection temperature because it's like a hard metal, like nickel typically, um, metal coating on the exterior. So if you have flash high temperatures and you want to expose an SLA part to those, those high temperatures, metallization can be a good way to expand the usability of SLA parts. Yeah, for FDM, uh, really looking at your two main finishing techniques uh, being vapor smoothing as well as painting. Painting, obviously, pretty straightforward because you can essentially apply it to, to dang near anything and does give you, you know, wide range of colors that, that you're able to work with. Vapor smoothing uh, can work for uh, FDM, but it won't be applied maybe to every material that you can print with an FDM, but it does uh, work for a vast majority of the FDM materials out there. And it does uh, essentially, uh, I don't want to say it eliminates the layer lines that you're looking at, but it does essentially smooth it out to where it's very hard to tell that it was an FDM printed part. And it is a, a recipe controlled process. So you can also kind of fine tune and tailor the vapor smoothing process to the FDM part that you're printing with. When we smooth out uh, Mark Forge parts, for example, you basically cannot tell that, that it was actually printed through a, a layer process. And it is also worth mentioning that it doesn't improve the mechanical uh, characteristics of the part because um, it does create a more isotropic exterior performance of the part. So you get some mechanical uh, improvements from it as well as cosmetic improvements. Uh, here's a question regarding specific to FDM. Can you improve the mechanical properties? In other words, the an anisotropic, uh, I can never use that word, uh, the non-isotropic uh, properties of FDM parts with finishing. Yeah, so that was uh, more or less what I was, you know, just touching on there, but you know, to elaborate on that, it, it is essentially like a surface hardening uh, a part to where you do get this exterior coat that is uh, performs much more, you know, it's similar to an isotropic uh, type part. And it does also, you know, generally kind of increase the overall impact resistance of the part. So we don't have actual numbers to work with at the moment to be able to kind of share just how much of an improvement you're gonna see, but you definitely will see an improvement and it will likely be a little bit geometry specific as well as material specific uh, in regards to that. Um, okay, one more on FDM. Um, can you still do metallization if you coat an FDM part in a conductive paint beforehand and then electroplate it? Jesse, you might have a little yes. bit more. Yes. yes, we can. Yes, we can. It's not really typically done as much with FDM, um, but it can absolutely be done. Yes, is the short answer to that question. It, it can, and it would improve its its surface fin or its certainly its mechanical capabilities or say conductivity, if necessary. I would also just a little bit on that vapor smoothing is that as as you get those build lines, you know the material layers are not completely fused together, and when you vapor polish uh, or vapor smooth, it does it does kind of chemically. Um, bond those la build layers uh, a little better together to improve the elongation and reduce that um, the anisotropic problems with FDM. Okay, so the next, so this is the <clears throat> excuse me finishing for multi jet fusion, and basically we apply all of these finishing processes. Pete already explained them all, so I won't need to um, again, but. It, all of these processes apply to multi jet fusion. In fact, I think most of the pictures in, in here show all multi jet fusion parts. Dyeing is inexpensive and fast. Um, vapor smoothing really improves the elongation and definitely some of the cosmetics. So vapor smoothing, we do have, Pete mentioned it's difficult to get numbers on, on FDM and that's because it varies so much by, with vapor smoothing, it depends so much on the material and the particular part geometry. But we do have some great information on vapor smoothing. Any of you are interested, please reach out. We can send a white paper on the, vipers, uh, the vapor smoothing that shows its improvement in mechanical properties. Um, also, it, it does have improvement on say, um, liquid pen, uh, penetration into the part. Like if you're looking for waterproofness, some air tightness, uh, vapor smoothing can really help the mechanical performance of multi jet fusion rigid parts. And then on the elastomer parts, the TPA and TPU that I mentioned that I showed this little squeezy ball it, or squeezy cube, it really improves, it changes the uh, elongation 
uh, up to 400%. So it really makes the parts a lot more stretchy and functional. That's one of the main reasons uh, we, we acquired them, the vapor smoothing machine in the first place. So it's great technology. Certainly painting, Cerakote we talked about adds UV stability, chemical resistance, color as we talked about there. It allows us to, to have a nice thorough uh, white color and, and bright vibrant colors. Um, it does add some temperature resistance and mechanical just toughness. It, it improves the surface hardness a little bit. And then as Pete mentioned, it adds very thin surface um, thickness. So it can, it can allow you to have great performance from your net shape design without having to add for the uh, tolerance for, for a coating. Hydrographics we mentioned can make some really cool looking parts like you can do diamond plate and, and uh, carbon fiber and wood grain. And as you can see, there's some kind of like cartoon type logos and, or some cartoon type graphics. There's really a huge range of amazing capabilities we can add with hydrographics. And then we talked about the, the metallization. And that's just one of the questions, to, uh, you, you touched on it with the white paper with the, the vapor surface smoothing, but the question was, can we improve the surface toughness or impact strength? And it made me think of that video um, that the truck drives over the parts. Is, is that's right. Is yeah, we have, we have that video. We'll find that, that um, there's two, two things. We had a, we had a handle that we showed that that's uh, throwing against a wall, uh, unsmoothed, it, it broke, it shattered. Uh, well, it, it cracked, and then in the vapor smooth, it did not. And then, same as Kristen just mentioned, um, you know, driving over a, a, a load on a part, it it did break on smooth, and then did not. And that's because of elongation. It basically smooths the surface finish and and um, effectively reduces the surface energy. All the small little granules that are sticking up are smoothed down, so they lock together better, which improves the improves not only the elongation, but as I mentioned earlier, the penetration of either air or water or liquids. Um, so it, it really improves the mechanical uh, capabilities of, of MJF. Here's an interesting one I haven't seen. Can you combine some of the finishing processes, i.e. dyeing and vapor smoothing or vapor smoothing and Cerakote? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Cerakote, if done without smoothing, um, is a little bit rougher than once it's smooth. Uh, it, it is a little smoother. But as I mentioned, you're kind of locking the surface molecules together down um, when you vapor smooth. And so then the Cerakote doesn't have as much to grab onto. So just like painting, if you don't have kind of a slightly roughened surface, you may end up with some with some chipping. Although the Cerakote is baked at temperature, so it does have more of a chemical bond to the surface of the, of the nylon uh, polypropylene or TPA materials. Um, so it, it can hold pretty well, but it definitely does improve the cosmetics. On the dyeing front, if we dye and then vapor smooth, it will darken the parts significantly. You see there's red, green, and blue shown. It makes them um, quite a bit darker. The black, it just makes it, you can see the picture right there with the with the cubic um, shape in the middle with vapor smoothing. There's undyed on the left and on the right is dyed and vapor smoothed. And it, it really makes parts like Pete mentioned earlier, look a lot like injection molded parts. So you can have them, you know, full production um, cosmetics out of a dyed and smooth part. We're going to combine a couple here. Um, is there an FDA approved technique or material suggested for production of parts that may be used for food or liquid consumption uh, combined with are any of the finishes considered hygienic? Good question. Pete, you want to talk about that? It's an FDM question. Yeah, well, I, th th there's a lot of, uh, you know, research and, and testing currently going into getting it approved for, you know, food applications, but currently there is no uh, approved material or method you know, for, for applications in that space. Some of it does have to uh, be correlated just to the, the layering process actually, um, being a, a, an area for kind of bacteria to propagate and, and grow. So I do know there is uh, quite a bit of research going into that and, and testing, uh, but currently no approved uh, methods at the moment. Or FDM, yeah. And then the, the, the MJF does have um, biocompatibility and skin contact certification for the PA-12 material, as well as uh, some of the, the TPU materials uh, I mentioned. So those those are FDA um, approved and we have, have the certifications for uh, the MJF. Now that can be affected by the secondary finishing. So Cerakote, for example, may not have it. Um, so if we take a smooth part or a, a, a 3D printed multi-diffusion part and then apply say paint or maybe some of the Cerakote colors, um, that may negate that. So secondary finishing would be a consideration that would affect the answer. Okay, Good so questions. we've got a few kind of more general questions. Um, what about UV exposure? Um, can you discuss this in general? Sure. Yeah, with with stereolithography, stereolithography is cured by a UV laser, and so once it, the part is done being built, it has to be it's taken out, build supports are removed, and then it's put in a UV oven to complete the curing. 
um, but it continues to cure under UV exposure over time. So if you have stereo lithography parts that are exposed to even lighting, fluorescent lighting in an office, it'll continue to yellow over time, um, both in the white and the clear. It happens in the black also, you just can't see it. Um, so that is definitely UV um, uh, uh, sensitive, let's call it. On the FDM front, I would say it's probably um, that and multidiffusion, depending on the material, are, are the least UV um, sensitive materials, which is why they can be used so extensively. There is some um, some change with UV, and that can be prevented um, in multidiffusion with the Cerakoting. Cerakot um, adds adds tremendous UV stability. Yeah, and then and on the go ahead, Pete. It's going to mention material wise for FDM and off the Stratasys systems, the ASA uh, material would be you know your best fit for UV resistant um, you know applications. Great for you know outdoor type opportunities. Yeah, even more, even a little more than ABS. That's kind of ASA's place in the world is, is good environmental resistance. Yep. Great question. Um, I'm gonna add a bit to this question. The question is, are super polymers replacing metals in some use cases? And I, I'd like to add in maybe the composites as well that you, you're talking about with the Mark Forged. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think you could say that it's replacing it. Uh, Will it replace every metal part? No. I mean, and I think that's important to clarify that even with some of these really awesome composites that that you know you're you're looking at, it's never going to replace every metal part. But when it does make sense, it's it's a great fit to move over to using additive printed parts. So you know, it does require a little bit of uh, investment into understanding the application and maybe understanding kind of the the fiber reinforcement process so that you uh, really optimize your part for using fiber where and when you need it. Um, a lot of times we can see people kind of uh, break the bank more or less by trying to embed way too much fiber into some of the composite parts. So definitely an important uh, piece in the process to make sure that you're using enough fiber when and where. Um, you know, for some of the things like the, the Alta materials, being able to replace metal parts in uh, direct, you know, comparative scenarios, you can, um, but it's probably not really the best fit for, for using Ultim to maybe replace some of the metal components in, in what you're doing. Uh, that's probably where the, the Mark Forge technology would lend itself better. Uh, the, the Ultim materials are definitely a better fit for kind of your, your high-end aerospace applications as well as some of the uh, medical applications for those materials. I'll, I'll add there, thanks Pete, I'll, I'll add that there has been a lot of metal replacement with multi-jet fusion when considering that say maybe you've been machining metal components because that's kind of what the capability you have in house or you say have a manifold or some parts that you've just been making metal for a long time but as your need for performance out of that part increases say you want to add in very complex holes that you can't really machine um, we, we are replacing the functionality of metal we're not really necessarily I'm trying to directly say this is as strong as an aluminum or steel part, but you were using metal in the first place because it was a convenient and an expensive material and able to be machined. Now, if you can 3D print it in a polymer um, and then get some very, you know, very difficult shape, latticing, lightweight, part geometry um, consolidation, eliminating fasteners, uh, maybe eliminating a leak potential area, there's some tremendous applications for 3D printing in polymers that can be replacements for, for metals. All right, I think that's all the time we have for today. Uh, we have one minute right. left, so just wanted to share the QR codes to connect with these guys on LinkedIn. Um, any additional questions, you can send to quotes at goproto.com. Um, we do also have all of the questions that we didn't get a chance to answer. Someone will follow up with you uh, with some answers to those as well. Uh, any closing words, Jesse and Peter? I want to really thank everyone for their time today. Thanks very much to invite you to continue to engage with us. We will continue to have uh, the follow-up uh, webinar series and, and I look forward to seeing you there. And then Peter. Likewise, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, it's always a pleasure.